Okay, first thing I would like you to do is to take this comment here and I'd like you to work on that for just about five minutes. It's a little exercise. Please take five minutes and a pad of paper or your computer and I'd like you to write down some way uh, that crime has directly impacted your life. Now, this could be in any one of a number of ways. Uh, perhaps you've been a victim of crime. And I'd like you to write a little bit about maybe what happened, how that felt, uh, how that changed maybe your life uh, and some of the ramifications of that. Uh, you could also ask a friend maybe and have a discussion about their experience. Um, you might have at some point been a perpetrator perhaps, and I'm not going to ask you to reveal that to anyone, but you could describe how that uh, affected your life and the feelings and uh, processes that might have come with that. Okay, take five minutes and come back to this. All right, now that you've taken a few minutes, we can talk a little bit more about what is this field we're in, criminology. You just described your personal experience related to crime. And everyone understands the world individually through our experience. But as it says here, criminology is the scientific approach to understanding crime, to understanding things like criminal behavior and uh, law violations and violators. So criminologists look for patterns. We want to understand larger um, connections between many, many, many different types of events. And that can be very useful because we can then maybe use uh, that information in order to explain things, which perhaps we can use to predict outcomes in the future. And then that is very, very powerful because you might use that information to inform social policy. So that's how criminology is a scientific discipline. It's science in pursuit of um, patterns through a systematic study, systematic evaluation. Now what is science based on here? It's empirical and we value what's called empiricism. Empiricism can be defined as experience derived from your senses. Your senses are things like touch, taste, sight, sound, smell. In Western culture we very much privilege information gained visually. Okay? Um, but we collect that data, that concrete stuff, and we, we evaluate that um, in a very different way than maybe other ways of knowing, such as, for example, a belief or faith. We want to study the world as it is. I knock on the table for the indication of like the concrete world, the real world not just belief and not just individual experience. All right. A few distinctions before we move on. We can talk about the difference between criminology, which again you have defined on the uh, part here that I just marked. You can define that against criminal justice. And criminal justice is really more the study of agents of social control. Okay. So you've got, for example, the police, you've got corrections, and you've got court systems. All of those three fall under the category of uh, criminal justice and what they study. You could talk about criminology versus deviance. This is tricky because again, criminology, you're looking at what causes crime, how frequently does crime occur. Uh, if you study deviance, then you're studying the idea of the violation of norms. Laws can be seen as much more specific than norms. Um, laws are basically enforced by a state and so any crime is the violation of a law which is enforced by the state. Every uh, discussion of the state means different jurisdictions. Okay, so state can involve something like your uh, city or county, the actual state, and then federal laws. All right. uh, deviance 
you can obviously have violations of norm that do not fall under crime. A great example of that would be mental illness, right? It's not illegal to be mentally ill. Conversely, though, you can have certain instances where you might engage in a crime, but because so many other people are engaging in the crime, that's considered normal. One example I like to think of is if you were to go speeding on an interstate today, you might notice a lot of other people speeding. So even though that's technically criminal, it doesn't seem to be violating a norm. It doesn't seem to be deviant. All right. Last thing on this page, we have the field sociology of law. I think of this as how uh, law affects society and how society affects law. Uh, how society can shape law and how law can shape society. So one example of this uh, might be uh, the idea of um, domestic violence. In the past, say in the 1600s in Europe, there really wasn't any idea about domestic violence and it wasn't considered criminal, certainly. Uh, eventually, that changed. In the United States, there started to become uh, laws related to this especially related to things like, for example, the development of the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. Um, so protecting minority groups and their rights. Uh, so those kinds of changes and patterns and observations over time would be something you'd look at under the sociology of law. All right. Now I want to talk with you about the development of criminology over time. And as you know, we just talked about criminology as a science. Uh, there hasn't always been a scientific approach to studying things. Of course, we've had times where uh, superstition and fear ruled, uh, where truth was often rooted in faith and religion. And in order to make sense of where ideas come from, it's nice to address them chronologically. So to begin, Let's talk about the early Middle Ages. This is a period you could think of in Western Europe between eh, roughly 1200 and 1400, depending on who you talk to, where what happened was uh, fear and superstition ruled. So people who violated norms or religious practices were believed to be possessed. And those people were often dealt with very harshly if you were believed to be possessed by demons, uh, you might not have a whole lot of chance at rehabilitation. And so that's why you see some of the punishments during that period as very, very harsh. Uh, one of the things that the period was known for was something called trial by ordeal. So as an example, a woman who might be accused of adultery would have um, a metal rod that the um, judges would place in a fire and then she would have to hold the metal rod, and if her flesh burned, then she was believed guilty of adultery. So you can see where this is going. Uh, and then she might later then be burned at the stake. Okay. So this was a particular way of thinking about crime, and it was related to the strength of religion. In this period, religion was the dominant source of truth. And if you were to look at, for example, Europe in this period. The most beautiful buildings would be the churches in these towns. They would be really the centers for cultural life. You would have the most beautiful stained glass, architecture. If you've ever been in an old church, you know the acoustics can be marvelous. And that's where people would learn about why the world was the way it was. Eventually, we moved away from that source of truth. And the key idea that allowed us to do that, it's called the Enlightenment. I'd like you to know the Enlightenment as an intellectual movement in Western Europe that involved four things. Okay? The first thing the Enlightenment involves is reason and rationality. This is a new idea of promoting logic and reason to understand the world reason and rationality first. Second, the Enlightenment thinkers promoted science and secularization. We already talked about science in the 
previous slide. Secularization is about a move away from religion as a source of truth. Okay? Moving away from religion as a source of truth. Science, of course, is rooted in empiricism. So there's this new source of truth. Okay? So reason and rationality, science and secularization. The third element of Enlightenment thought is progress with a capital P. Progress is the idea that humans can make the world better. We can make uh, things um, better for new generations. We can improve upon the world, and we don't have to accept the problems that the world might offer us. Uh, for example, if our crops fail, we might develop different irrigation techniques to ensure that doesn't happen. Uh, we don't have to say, oh, the crops failed, it's God's will, and that's how it is. We don't have to accept um, starvation. We can uh, change, for example, uh, medical practices. Uh, we can eradicate diseases. Eventually we'll be able to do things like split an atom. Um, we can map out the human genome so we can understand our genetic uh, DNA codes, which is an amazing achievement. So progress, we can improve on the world. Okay, that's the third characteristic. Fourth characteristic of the Enlightenment to know, Enlightenment thinkers stressed individual freedom individual freedom. And that is related to, for example, um, the United States uh, when we had our Declaration of Independence. Uh, we wanted, for example, the freedom of religion. We wanted freedom of speech. Okay, This was a very new thing after 1600 or so in Europe. Okay, So this period, you just uh, we were just talking about here the early Middle Ages. The Middle Ages itself, you could say, runs to about 1600. Okay? And that's just a rough, arbitrary stopping point. The Enlightenment started to happen between 1600 and, let's just say, 1750 AD in Europe. Okay? From 1750 forward, the new period is called the modern period. And what you start to see with the modern period is a change in thinking from this old religious orientation towards something new. And so these two fellows, I want to talk with you about uh, Beccaria and Bentham, were both Enlightenment thinkers. And these are the guys responsible for classical criminology. Classical criminology promotes certain ideas. One of them is that people are utilitarian, which means that um, people uh, try to judge things based on criteria like usefulness and reasonableness. Okay? Uh, utilitarianism, what use can I make of it? Bakari and Bentham also argued for uh, people thinking in terms of hedonism. And hedonism is, in rough terms, a seeking of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Okay, So people make decisions trying to avoid pain and they want pleasure. They make decisions, again, based on um, what seems like the best approach. This also emphasizes free will. Okay, The idea that people make choices, and that's where you get this notion of rational choice that we weigh the strengths and weaknesses of arguments. We weigh the strengths and weaknesses of different uh, approaches to behavior, or actually, let me better say that. We uh, try to make informed decisions as to what type of behavior is in our best interest and what type could really hurt us. So the key ideas then from these Enlightenment thinkers, Vicaria and Bentham, are things like crime is a function of free will, right? It's about personal choice. If you implement punishment, that will deter crime, all right? Because people are reasonable and rational. This is a very, very different view than what was held in the early Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages about how you could address crime and the extent to which people are responsible for their own behavior. Here, you have the development of personal responsibility and 
the possibility of rehabilitation, perhaps. People can learn from their mistakes. That's very different from this period, where it's very hard to rehabilitate people who are, for example, possessed by the devil. Okay? So classical criminology largely rooted in uh, Enlightenment thought, and Beccaria and Bentham were both Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, Beccaria, Beccaria uh, was interested in reforming the law in his day, okay? and he wanted to do such radical things as, uh, for example, allow people to confront their accusers directly. Um, so law before him uh, was not very rational or systematic. Uh, Jeremy Bentham was a fascinating guy. He was a moral philosopher. He was an economist. Um, he thought about uh, prison design and came up with the notion of a panopticon. Panopticon is fascinating because it's a central tower with a circular shaped prison design around it. The guards are in the center and they'll be able to see out to all the other prisoners. So they felt like they were being watched, even maybe when they weren't. So that promotes, again, rational choice and people thinking out hard about whether or not they should do things. The next era that comes along promotes biological positivism. And you see these three names here. I'm not big on you learning dates, okay? But I would like you to note that these dates are chronologically a little bit earlier than these dates, okay? So biological positivism comes a little bit after classical criminology. And you've got people like Auguste Comte, who is seen as the father of sociology, if you will, and uh, the founder of what's called positivism. Franz Joseph Gall and Cesare Lombroso. And we will talk about each of those in turn. Um, Lombroso was a huge figure in uh, criminal anthropology. We'll talk a good deal about him. All right, so we've been talking a little bit about the different periods uh, where different theories of crime and views of crime have developed. We left off with biological views of crime, biological positivism. And the main idea here is empiricism rooted in biology. And what does that mean? It means that these criminologists looked at people and looked at them for indicators of their propensity toward crime. Okay, So, for example, you see the development of phrenology and physiognomy. Phrenology is the study of bumps on the head to infer your personality. Physiognomy would be the study of facial features to, again, infer personality and character. Okay? So the idea behind this biological positivism is that crime is rooted within something inside you. So certain physical, chemical, or neurological qualities, biological features, genetic features, that are unique and that criminals have that make them different from other people. All right. Biological positivism is different from this social positivism, which is under the category of sociology. Two fellows are worth knowing about here, Adolf Kudelet and Emile Durkheim. And these dates you'll see roughly parallel a little bit of what we just saw with biological positivism. But biology can only explain so much about crime. These people were focusing more on uh, the social um, reasons for crime, how crime can be explained socially. A big concept is anomie, and this is a term that's from Emile Durkheim. The idea was that you have two uh, different types of societies that Durkheim wanted to focus on. He focused on the traditional period, okay, which you could roughly say is about pre-1600 Europe, and the more modern period, which is from 1750 forward. Okay. He looked at the traditional period as having what he called mechanical solidarity. Mechanical solidarity means people believe in shared values and norms. Okay. So again, People tended to believe in the same kinds of things 
because many people thought in terms of the same faith in Europe, right? Religion ruled. And as we move away from religion with secularization, okay, you start to see people not sharing the beliefs. So Durkheim asked, what holds society together? If we don't have shared beliefs, what is it? And he argued that in the modern period, we all do specialized tasks and we have to depend on each other for those things. Here's an example. Uh, you uh, probably could look over your clothes right now and you probably haven't made any of those. You depend on someone else to make them. You depend on someone else to make the computer you use every day that you're using right now uh, and you don't know even how to repair that or um, things like this. You pay someone else money to be able to do that and you're studying this topic right now in order to specialize in this field. So we all depend on each other for individual specialization. Okay. Durkheim said that society is rooted in organic solidarity. Okay. So again, mechanical solidarity is when you have shared beliefs. Organic solidarity is when you have task specialization. We don't all agree on things today, but we don't have chaos because we're interdependent. All right. This concept of anomi is from Durkheim. And what Durkheim wanted to say is, in the move from mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity, we experience more anomi, which is normlessness. Okay? We don't have strong norms like we used to. So we have higher suicide rates and crime rates. Here are some of the key ideas we'll talk about more. But in social positivism, you have statistics and demographic data that can use, be used to look at social change. Okay? Um, you can develop a um, study of patterns related to things um, such as uh, the sex of a population, the time of year, in which um, crime patterns vary. Uh, the population composition, do we have uh, different patterns of crime related to race or age? And we certainly do and, and we'll certainly look at uh, more of those. And I'd like to add one more thing before we move on I didn't touch on. Atavistic anomalies. This is a concept which comes from uh, Lombroso from the previous slide. Atavism is the idea of um, people being throwbacks to an earlier period. So for Lombroso, criminals were less developed. And you could see this through indicators like, for example, a larger jaw or forehead, beady eyes, things like this. Okay, now we'll move on. The development of the next set of theories in criminology come along with uh, what's called the Chicago School. And the Chicago School was um, the University of Chicago, which became a very dominant sociology department in the 1920s and 30s in the United States, the premier sociology department. There are several names that we can briefly talk about, um, but people like Park, Burgess, uh, Lewis Wirth, Clifford Shaw and Henry McKay, and Frederick Thrasher. Fred Thrasher studied uh, gangs in Chicago, and he did a study called The Gang, uh, about 1,313 gangs in Chicago, uh, believe it or not, in the 1920s. These were people who were interested in uh, the role that social institutions play in crime, and uh, they studied social ecology. In other words, they looked at cities and the effects that different city environments have on crime and creating criminals. Uh, they came up with a notion here, social disorganization. In very simple terms, this means that if the institutions in a neighborhood or a community are not working, if they're disorganized, then you see more crime. And that's captured with this set of ideas here that I've, I've written. Socially disorganized areas are natural areas for crime. 
You know this too, if you've ever driven around in a big city, you'll suddenly see maybe a change from one neighborhood to another, and you'll realize that maybe the institutions in that neighborhood are not well funded or don't work very well. That uh, helps allow for crime uh, to develop in those places. Social psychology is the next uh, evolution, if you will, of um, ideas about crime and theories. Uh, two names here, uh, Edwin Sutherland, funny enough, is from Gibbon, Nebraska, and he's dead now, but he grew up there uh, in the late 1800s uh, and early 1900s, I believe, and a guy named Walter Reckless. Uh, they focused on socialization, which is the process of becoming human, the process of learning a culture. Okay, So the focus for social psychologists is on crime as something learned, okay, and something that you develop through things like uh, patterns of, of learning about uh, things through maybe, for example, your parents or the media. Um, so parental control, um, how per parents promote um, abiding by norms, um, and maybe the other problems related to this. For example, some people could be socialized into crime. The final area we can talk about briefly is conflict criminology. And this is rooted in the work primarily of Karl Marx, who is responsible for looking at capitalism as basically in a very, very simplified form, we'll say, involving two groups, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie you can think of as the owners of the means of production. They own property. The proletariat are workers. So the proletariat are always working for the bourgeoisie. And the idea is that for Marx, the economic system controls all aspects of human life. Okay? It's the root for how human life um, continues and, and is maintained. So these owners of the means of production, the bourgeoisie, are exploiting taking advantage of the laborers. So it's called conflict criminology because these criminologists believe that there are people with different amounts of power and have different access to scarce resources. So if you look at different kinds of conflict, you could say that maybe conflict criminology could be useful not only to study uh, the differences between um, rates of incarceration for, say, white-collar crime as opposed to street-level, you know, working-class crime. But you could also look at um, feminism, for example. Um, why is it that uh, women might be disproportionately uh, imprisoned for certain types of offenses? Um, there are all kinds of conflicts. Uh, we could talk about uh, racism in the criminal justice system, for example. So these are very basic ideas that we will then uh, used to look at conflict more broadly. Right? Let's move on to the new topic. How do we do criminology? Uh, this is going to involve the process of this particular field. And there are many, many facets of criminology, sub-areas that people can focus on. One thing we could talk about are statistics, criminal statistics the development of um, data about crime. There are two things I would like you to know about with this. The development of, of good statistics involves getting what are called valid and reliable measures. Let's start with reliable. Okay. If you think of something that's reliable, generally that means it's consistent over time. A reliable friend is there for you. So reliability is consistency over time. Validity means measuring what you intend to measure. Okay. So criminal statistics involve, for example, the development of reliable and valid measures. Research methods, we're going to spend uh, a lot of our second chapter discussing. So how should we study crime? Should we use interviews? Maybe we could study it. Uh, through 
um, surveys. Maybe we should use experiments. Okay, we'll talk more about that. We've already discussed the sociology of law, and you can think of this as studying law and patterns of law over time to account for changes. Uh, law is a process that's interrelated with society as it changes. Okay. Theory construction and testing we're going to go into quite a bit in the next couple of slides, so I'll wait to do that. Criminal behavior systems and typologies. These are typologies basically a simple, I'm sorry, typology is a complicated word for a classification scheme. So you could have like, for example, a typology of rapists. And you might find there are three different types of rapists related to different uh, problems that they may have had. It's important to have typologies because then you can come up with maybe better policy for addressing different types. You could also come up with typologies for um, the idea of uh, crimes themselves. So a very, very simple typology would say for example, violent crime versus property crime. What are the characteristics of each one? Okay. A few more things. Penology and social control. This is really the study of corrections and, and how to address crime once it's occurred. Okay. Victimology is an entire course of its own here at UNK, and it's the study of the relationship between victims and crime. Okay. Hi, I'd like to talk with you a little bit more in depth about the role of theory in criminology. Theory is usually pretty abstract for people, okay? hard for some people to get. And the most basic way I can think of, of explaining it is to say theory is an explanation. Theory is designed to address why questions. Okay, Why does my foot hurt? Okay, I have a theory that there might be a rock in my shoe. Okay, So I check to see, and lo and behold, there's a rock. I've explained why my foot hurts. Right? When we talk about criminology, you've got different kinds of theories, and they have different explanations. Right? So they're going to emphasize different types of things. Biological theories are going to emphasize things like brain chemistry affecting, for example, levels of aggression or maybe um, uh, the food that you eat uh, impacting your mood or feelings or behaviors. Okay. Sociological explanations might focus on something like socialization patterns, okay? um, how we learn about our society and that affects our criminal acts and those accepted in society. Uh, you might have economic explanations for crime. That could include, for example, things like the relationship of poverty uh, to crime. The theories that we're going to look at uh, also toward uh, the latter part of our textbook will be combining um, some of these different elements. Okay, But I like to think of theories as like tools. You use a specific tool for a specific job. So a theory will explain some things but might not be as useful for explaining other things. All right, and we'll talk more about that. Scientific theories involve three things that we'll go through one at a time. So you don't have to write these three things down right away. Um, I'm going to go through them in more depth, you know, on the way down here. I'm trying to make an arrow. Yikes, that was not a very nice looking arrow. Um, but we'll talk about all three of these in more detail in this slide and the following slides. Okay. Theories all involve things like concepts, the way that concepts are defined, and you can have nominal definitions or operational definitions. And you have propositions, which are really just basically relationships between um, concepts, different types of relationships. You can have uh, positive linear, negative linear, curvilinear, and then there's the possibility of there being no relationship between your concepts. Okay, What are these things concepts? We use them all the time. Words or phrases. Okay, And they represent something in the world. So as an example, a concept is something like crime. 
or poverty. You know, um, they're very, very um, what um, ever present. We use them all day long. What we're doing with theories is we want to explain the relationship between these concepts. So, one example uh, you could ask: uh, Does poverty cause crime, or does crime cause poverty? Um, there are two possible routes uh, to explaining crime. It's also important to think about how we define our concepts. And there are two ways of defining concepts, nominal and operational. If we're taking nominal definitions, then really those are very abstract and very um, broad <laughs> definitions. So a nominal definition, for example, of crime might just be a violation of criminal law. Okay? It's very broad and abstract. Yeah. A nominal definition of homelessness might be the condition of not having a home. Okay? So very broad. The problem with nominal definitions is it's hard to do research that you can compare based on those definitions. So researchers develop what are called operational definitions. Right? Operational definitions are all about how you're going to measure some type of concept. So as an example, to go with the above uh, idea of the definition of crime, you could say crime is any violation of law, right? That's a very broad definition. But if you want to measure it for research purposes, you could say, I'm going to focus on crimes known to the police that are reported in the FBI's Uniform Crime Report or what's commonly called the UCR. Okay? That would be how I could measure crime in an operational way. I'll give you a different example. A nominal definition of homelessness is the condition of being without a home. Broad. A nominal, I'm sorry, an operational definition of homelessness would be the condition of not having a home or a rental space for a period of uh, greater than two weeks and um, also not having a stable uh, mailing address. Okay, That's making it a little bit uh, more clear what exactly you're going to be measuring. A nominal definition of poverty would be the condition of being poor. An operational definition might be poverty is a person in the United States making below ten thousand dollars a year. It's very clear what you're measuring with that definition of poverty. And the thing about these is, we don't all have to agree on the same nom, I'm sorry, we don't all have to agree on the same operational definition of things in science. But we clarify our assumptions through them. Okay? That's why they're important. We make clear what we assume. So if my definition of poverty is under $10,000 a year and yours is under fifteen. dollars we know we can't really compare those results too well, all right? But at least we know what our assumptions are. If we have interrelated concepts, then we have what are called propositions. So uh, one type of proposition you could say is, if poverty goes up, crime goes up. That is called a positive linear relationship, which is on the next slide. All right, so what I just described to you in the previous slide, a positive linear relationship. And let me give you a little diagram for that as best as I can with this very um, awkward pen that I have here. Uh, if you have, for example, uh, crime over here, let's put a C, and you've got poverty down here, that's a very bad P, uh, and you have uh, a negative sign here and a positive sign here, and a negative sign and a positive sign. Then, let me draw that chart again. If you have crime going up like this, and poverty also going up, that is a positive linear 
relationship. Okay, so again, uh, if you have crime going up and poverty going up together, then you have a positive linear. Conversely, if you have crime going down and poverty going down, that is also in my same chart I drew. Here's crime, here's poverty. Okay, that is also a positive linear relationship. So if it helps you to draw this out, you'll see it. Okay, so they both can increase or decrease together. All right. Also, too, if you spend more time typically studying, right, you're probably going to get a better grade. So that's another example of a positive linear. A negative linear relationship is when you have the same chart that I drew a second ago, right, and you've got the two negatives here, and you've got things going up, that's supposed to be a plus, and this is supposed to be a plus. Right? And you've got one thing going up, but then another thing going down. Then you have a negative linear relationship. So let's say as crime goes up, poverty goes down. That is a negative linear relationship. Conversely, you could say if poverty goes down here, crime goes up here, that is, as I just said, um, a negative linear relationship. Okay? Curvilinear relationships are funky. Um, again, using that little diagram I've been drawing, again, the plus is up, the minuses are down here. A curvilinear, let's say that you've got heat, temperature, that goes up, okay? Crime might go up for a while, but then it might start coming back down. So maybe around 85 degrees, believe it or not, this is actually true, criminals start getting too hot, and they don't want to commit more crime. So that is a curvilinear relationship, right? In our previous example, uh, if poverty goes up, that may um, have crime go up somewhat, but then it might start going down as people get poorer and poorer, for example. Okay. Finally, you can have a possibility where there really is no discernible relationship. So if you've got something like this, and eventually this arrow is disappearing here, you know, you've got kind of a shotgun pattern of all kinds of different things going on that is hard to tease out any relationship. That's also a possible outcome. But uh, the reason we do research is to figure out if there's some type of relationship. Okay?